All right. So I promised to talk about how I came to love cities. And I, what I want to do is to talk about how we actually come into cities. The first slide that I'm showing you, can anyone recognize what's that at the top? That strip. It's a fire, it's a fire of crop stubble. I used to come to Hyderabad from about 100 miles away, and I knew exactly when I was halfway towards Hyderabad when I saw those crops, the stubble being burned. 45 years later, now Delhi has been constantly having air pollution problems because of that. But think about it, coming into the city at that time and even now, you have to pass through agriculture. You have to pass through fields. You have to pass through a lot of land which is used for producing food and other things that we need. The second strip that you're seeing here is grape wines. The other thing that I always looked out for when I came to Hyderabad was the grape wines. Exactly about 20, 25 kilometers away from Hyderabad, I would see grape wines, and I knew that I was approaching Hyderabad. And then, once I reached Hyderabad city, that's what I saw. Railway tracks, which are zigzag, which are crossing, which are cutting through each other, an immensely complicated infrastructure, and that's what I passed through. That was one way of coming into the city for me, which is coming by land, coming by bus, by train, by car, whatever the means may be, but it is essentially coming into the city through agriculture, right? What did I see when I came into the city? <clears throat> the picture that you're seeing here was actually taken two years ago, but this is exactly what I used to see 50 years ago. These are people who are waiting for work on the street corner. They sit there, they chat, they're waiting, they're waiting for someone to come and pick them up and give them work. This picture also was taken two years ago. We used to go and buy fruits from people like that. We used to buy food from people like that. And these are all streets that, even now when I walk through them, I go back to 50, 60 years ago. I see kids like this. And I remember sitting around on the street corners exactly like these kids. And I think about what that city was like, right? I walk by and I see a signboard that I used to see 50 years ago. Do you see the corner at the top on the right side? Old jail building. And I used to wonder who stayed in that jail 150 years ago, 100 years ago, right? As we walked through the city, we saw people, we saw children, we saw people at work, we saw people who were enjoying themselves even while doing all of this, struggling through life. That's what the city was. And the city also had a lot of infrastructure, buildings, signboards, signs that belonged to or at least pointed to a time that doesn't exist anymore. This building is no longer actually used as a jail. It's used as a building in which a lot of people, including people who sharpen knives, people who sell old locks, repair locks, those are the people who occupy that building. What do I see when I come into the city now? Very often, I fly in and I see the clouds. That's the first thing that I notice when I'm coming into the city because the plane comes down to that altitude where you're passing through clouds. And then I see those lights. It's a maze, it's brilliant, it's bright, it's very enticing, it's like a magical world, but it's a world in which I can't see any of the details. I don't see the children, I don't see anything, I don't see mangoes, I don't see grapes, I don't see anything, right? But it's great. This image is from NASA. <clears throat> NASA for the last 20 years has been shooting pictures of the Earth every night, taking images of lights. 
and it has now become an amazingly rich resource for us to understand how cities have grown. Where have the new cities come up? Because when you have a city, you have lights. When you have rural areas, the lighting is thinner. So we know from a distance, from a satellite, through images, we can figure out where has cities grown, where have towns grown, how bright are they. Can you see Hyderabad in this? Right here in the middle. Imagine coming to Hyderabad from the space in a space shuttle or just dropping down from there. We'll just disappear before we reach Hyderabad. Right? So, the city means people, it also means those lights, it also means those grapes, it also means the crops burning, it also means all of these things. That's what cities are about. They're never about one single place in the city. It's many different things, many different things connected, many different things cutting through each other. And I have grown up in this city, but also worked in many cities, constantly feeling drawn, attracted by these images of what the city really means. What does it mean for me to be in Hyderabad among 8 million other human bodies who live here, who make this a home here, who work here, who play here? That's what the city is. It's crowds. It's people of all kinds of persuasions coming together, doing things. This is my office in Hyderabad once a year. For a few days, that entire street turns into this kind of a space. How did this come about? That's what Hyderabad was 400 years ago. You see Golconda Fort, which was a trading center and the military center. And then Charminar was built, and there was a strip of habitation connecting the two. About 75 years later, you begin to see people having moved here. There's a little bit of growth here. And then you see Sikandrabad, right north of Hussain Sagar. And this area, Golconda, becomes depopulated. This area begins to grow towards the north. By 1900, the north begins to grow further south, and the south begins to grow further north. By 1930, the growth begins to increase. By 1944, you have a tremendous amount of shift happening, and something happens here which you're not seeing in the map right now. The city, for the first time, begins to think about itself as a place into which water has to be pumped out from somewhere and water has to be drained out. That was never the case until the turn of the 20th century. We had water where we lived. We lived by the riverside, we lived by the lake. But by 1920s, we begin to see cities because they've grown and we have already begun to lose the water bodies in the city. We now have to pump water into the city and start taking out the wastewater. By 1961, you see a lot more growth, and you see these big tanks on the Musi River, the Himayat Sagar and Usman Sagar lakes, which are supplying water for us. This is another way of thinking about the city, and this is what my work mostly is now. I still think about cities, I still think about who lives where, who does what. And what we have done in this map is to map all the slums in the city, we mapped all the buses, we mapped all the bus frequencies, how many people move by which bus to where in a day. Now you see, this is something that most people cannot see when, I, when they first look at the map, but I can make out and people who think about transportation in the city can make out. You see this dark blue line is the line along which the maximum amount of mobility is happening. That's the axis along which the largest number of people are moving every day. And this 
is something that you will understand as a major physical torque force on the city if you know that people always in Hyderabad move from north to south and south to north. Just think about the bus route numbers in Hyderabad. Route number one, route number two, route number three, all from Secunderabad to Charminar and Charminar to Secunderabad. That's all they were. This was a city which basically moved from north to south and south to north. It didn't move east to west, but now it does. And because of the transformation, what you actually have here is an entire city being turned like that and a huge amount of growth here and as you see on the western side you really don't have that many buses. What does that mean? It means that people either cannot move or if they move they'll have to move in cars. That's what is going on in Hyderabad now. People have to move but they don't have public transportation and therefore you have traffic conditions. You get stuck all the time, right? How did we do this? What we did was to go to each bus stop in Hyderabad and take the latitude and longitude of those bus stops. And then, with the latitude and longitude of each bus stop put on as a pin on the map, then we started adding the bus routes. Then we started adding the number of people who were moving, right? And then we started wondering, how are the poor people moving? Because we assume that in slums, poor people live. Do they have buses? And the nice thing actually about Hyderabad is that a lot of bus stops do stop somewhere closer to the older slums. The new ones don't. Increasingly, access for poor people in the city in certain locations can only happen by auto rickshaws. It cannot happen by buses because there are no buses at the right time, there are no buses in the right places, and so they have taken auto rickshaws constantly, and that's the only way in which it moves. And I'll talk about the auto rickshaws in a minute when I tell you the numbers, which is quite stunning. This is a map of poor people, again, by percentage, right? You see those, those dark spots? All of those dark spots are places where the poorest of the people are living, the concentration of poverty in certain places. And it would be really interesting to see why are though so many poor people living in one particular place? What happens around it? What kinds of jobs are available to them? What kinds of infrastructure is available to them? How did all of this happen? Think about how people build houses. This is an amazingly rich area. That's Filmnagar at the top. You come down the hill slope, you come to Sheikhpet Kota Cheru, and then you go a little further, the land flattens, and when it flattens, you have apartments there. What's on these hill slopes? You have 18 slums, because that was the only land available to them, and they started building houses there. And what kind of houses? Just look at this picture here. This is how they get water. Think how difficult it is to pump water up a hill, up to your roof, and how difficult it is to actually drain out sewage and storm water if you're on a hill slope, right? On the slope, it will come down, of course, if you put a pipe, but what, how many pipes? What kinds of pipes? You can't hide it underground on a hill slope, right? That's what happens here. These are steps that go down. It's literally like a street going up a hill. Hyderabad is full of places like this, and that's what makes Hyderabad city such a lovely place for me, that people have figured out how to live in different locations. When they don't have any opportunities, they make their own houses. A large part of the housing in Hyderabad city is created by people themselves. You start with one little stone, you add. You add brick by brick by brick by brick, you add and build your houses. And we call it auto-construction, right? It's self-made. It's literally like snails. You have your own shell, and you move with it. And you grow it from your own body, from your own, your own sweat. You literally bring together small bits and pieces of resources to make it happen. Finally, what makes the city so wonderful for me? What makes it so wonderfully heartbreaking 
is the fact that this is a city, like all cities in the world, whether you're looking at it from the satellite, whether you're driving through it, whether you're taking the train, or you're flying in, cities are made by infrastructures, but they're made by people. And for those infrastructures to work, you need people. Who makes Hyderabad city really work? There are thousands and thousands of women who sweep our streets from 11 o'clock in the night till 5 o'clock in the morning, from 6 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the afternoon, from 2 o'clock till 8 o'clock, there are thousands of women, literally 21,000 women at one point, and this was five years ago, and the numbers would have grown by now, it's those women who sweep our streets. And Hyderabad city is known as one of the best, cleanest cities in the country. Most executives who come to Hyderabad tell you that it's a, we haven't seen clean streets like this anywhere in the country, right? Who are the others? There are 150,000 auto rickshaw drivers in Hyderabad. 98,300 of them are officially permitted to drive auto rickshaws in the city. Then there are people who work and live on the outskirts and make small forays into the city from time to time. They don't quite operate in the center of the city, but they do come in. Right? 150,000 auto rickshaw drivers. How many people are living on providing transportation to the public in the city? If you take an average family size of four, you're talking about six lakh people in a city of 80 lakhs. That's like almost 10%. 10% of the city's population is actually making a living by helping people move to their work. About 50,000 people keep the city clean, kill the mosquitoes, make it safe enough for you to live. That's what the city is about. And those people, often women in certain kinds of jobs, men in certain kinds of jobs, they live in extremely precarious conditions. How much do they earn? Where do they earn it from? How much security do they have? What are their children doing? What kinds of houses do they live in? What does all of this have to do with the rest of the way in which the city has grown? Not just Hyderabad, but Bombay, Delhi, Dehradun, Calcutta. That's what is the most exciting thing happening in the world, that there are lakhs and lakhs and lakhs of people who come together, figure out how to live, they keep going back to their villages, they transform our cities, they make them clean, they make them work for us. So that's what makes me love the city, and that's how I have grown to come to be here. Thank you so much.